Well, it all started uh, April 9th, 1995, when Christopher was born. Uh, he was born just a healthy baby, no problems. Um, he did everything he was supposed to do in the hospital to get to go home. He um, seemed perfectly fine. And uh, we left the hospital and things turned out to be not so fine. It took a few weeks of him being home and not being able to eat. And, and when he did eat, he would spit everything up and he was losing weight. Uh, he was originally nine pounds when he was born, but he soon lost tons of weight. I mean, he was dangerously underweight. And so uh, the process began of trying to figure out what was wrong, what was causing the problem. And of course, they thought it was a lot of different things to begin with. They thought it might be the flu, um, some real common things, um, or just that he had problems with swallowing or eating of, of some sort. And so he was put in the hospital and they did a lot of tests and it took about six months, but they finally figured out what was wrong with him. And the name of the actual disorder is called chronic pseudo obstruction syndrome. It's a very, very rare disease and um, they think it's a genetic um, and we didn't know he had it. We didn't even know there was a possibility that he could, could be born with this. He's actually our third son and our other two sons don't have any signs of any type of digestive disorder. So it was completely unexpected and the pregnancy was normal. So we never expected it. So it, it was really, really came out of the blue. Um, when we did find out what it was, then obviously the game was to try to figure out how to fix it or to try to figure out a way around it basically, because we found out that there was no cure for it. So we basically had to find a way around and that meant finding a way for him to eat. And so they came up with a system of using these feeding tubes. Uh, he actually had two. The first one um, went into his stomach. So it went from the outside in, it was surgically implanted. And that one was to drain out his stomach. His stomach didn't work at all. It was completely paralyzed. And so um, that we could drain out any saliva that he swallowed. Um, and any, any bile that backed up into his stomach, it basically gave us access to his stomach. The second tube that they installed, they put lower down and it went directly into his intestine itself. And that was the one that we actually used to feed him through. So that was basically how the system worked. Even though we were able to come up with a great solution to feed him, it doesn't mean that it wasn't without problems. There were a lot of struggles. The biggest problem, probably by far, was infection. And he spent a lot of time in the hospital and had a lot of surgeries around that issue because feeding tubes are, are a foreign thing in your body and your body wants to get rid of it. It doesn't want it to be there. And so there was just the problem with his body just trying to reject that and, and infection getting in there and just causing all kinds of problems. And he spent pretty much the first part of first three years of life in and out of the hospital. Um, total, he's had 14 surgeries, but, um, and a lot of them were around that issue of getting rid of infections um, because sometimes antibiotics just wouldn't work and they had to go in and clean it out and, and then do antibiotics as well. But it just, it was a constant, constant problem. So um, there were other struggles too. And yeah, just the hassle of dealing with a backpack and having to be fed, but for 14 hours a day? Yeah, uh, beginning. yeah a lot of that happened overnight. So we'd set up an IV pole and, you know, connect it up to the lower tube. So that'd go directly into his intestine throughout the evening. But then during the day, sometime there was a backpack that he had to wear. And it was funny, actually, there was some instances, like for example, going through the airport on security <laughs> where they wouldn't let us bring the backpack and we'd have to show them what it was. Yeah. But um, we had to make up these tubes uh, well, we called them tubes. Basically, they're ba IV bags that would go directly into his intestines with the formula. And so if we went on any trips at all, that was kind of a hassle because then we're carrying extra suitcases full of bags and paraphernalia and going through airports and taking an hour and a half to get through security. And that was uh, certainly part of the struggles. I don't know how much of that Christopher really, you know, dealt with too much. Um, then there was of course, you do snowboarding yeah, and yeah. basketball and kind of staying hydrated when you were playing basketball was interesting. I remember one time Christopher used to put water into his tube with a syringe 
And the first time is, you know, the parents and the teammates saw that, that kind of freaked some people out. <laughs> so, but, you know, we just dealt with it. It's, it was just part of, you know, Christopher's life and part of our life. And, um, you know, it was just, it was just stuff that we did. So we just kind of lived our lives around it. It was normal for us, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And Christopher did have it since he was a baby. He was, he had his feet, his feeding tubes were put in when he was six months old. So he doesn't really remember a time that he didn't have them. Um, he just grew up with them. And so it, for him, it was normal. And I mean, not getting to eat, that was, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, you could That's kind of a bummer and everything. Um, I said the biggest struggle, uh, I felt like I just couldn't get enough water in me to stay leveled. Um, throughout like the whole game everything mm-hmm. um, and I just felt like I needed water like throughout the whole game um, And I just wasn't getting enough. Yeah, because when I mean most of us have like stomachs that are almost used as gas tanks in a car And so we put the gas in and we can go long distances and that's kind of what our stomach is But with Christopher he was like a car without a gas tank So you kind of had to put little bits in yeah. as your fuel to keep you going mm-hmm. all the time Yeah, yeah, so, so it was and, just tough trying to keep that going when you're through. exerting yourself, you mm-hmm. know, that was a struggle. I remember I, I coached part of Christopher's <laughs> teams quite a bit, and he was always coming over and getting his syringe shots in his, <laughs> in his stomach. Yeah. yeah, and his energy level too. It mm-hmm. it's not the same. Tube feeding is now that he he you know after the miracle when he eats now it's so different because um, he notices the difference in his energy level. Um, he didn't know when he was being tube fed. He just thought everybody had that type of an energy level. He just he didn't notice the difference. And so that was another thing with sports is just trying to have enough energy and get it, keep enough calories going in order to support what he was doing. So, so with, the, with the basketball, you know, he had to put a lot of uh, fluids all the time. And, and so actually I was the coach and for some of his teams. And when Christopher played at Damascus Christian, which is where our kids went, um, the athletic director there, her name is Kim Stevens, and she's actually um, one of the leaders, I guess, in Heart to Heart Ministries for the kids in Honduras. So there was a charity event. The first charity event was a couple of years ago. And then the second charity event, um, we sponsored through our company, Mark Technologies, sponsored a table there. And the guest speaker was Bruce Vanata, or Vanetta, Bruce Vanetta. And so he talked a little bit about, actually quite a bit about his um, his story as far as how he got killed, or I'm sorry, not I guess he did get killed. He died and then came back. Do you want to explain a little bit about that? Yeah, well, he, he started telling his story about um, he has a specialty truck repair in Wisconsin. That's where he's from. And, and um, he was working on a, a huge semi-truck, and he was actually underneath it. The truck was part way up on one side it was on a a jack on a a jack is one of the tire the front tire was taken off. right the front tire was taken off and he was working underneath it on this you know so he's underneath you know working on it and he's looking over and he sees that jack just go it just he could just hear that sproing as it went and the whole truck actually fell on him and basically cut him in half and he had five severed arteries which no one had ever survived Mm. having five severed arteries and um, he immediately he wanted that truck off of himself. I mean, that was his first thought. And so the, the, the man that was working with him was trying to jack up the truck on the side and, and he wanted out from under the truck, but the guy's talking on to 911 and they're saying, don't move him because that's kind of the standard thing to do is not move someone. And, but he's thinking that that jack is gonna go again and he doesn't trust it and he wants out. And so he basically pulled himself out um, he grabbed the fender and pulled himself out until he got just just his head was sticking out. That was all that was out. And um, then he told us the rest of the story of how he actually that was the last thing that that he did. And he was then up on top of the garage, looking down and seeing all of the EMT workers and everyone coming in trying to help mm-hmm. him. And he's telling this whole story. And he then he continues and he talks about going to the hospital and everything that happened there and. Um, A man came and prayed for him, and his intestines actually grew, which intestines don't grow. Usually when you lose them, that's it. You're done. You don't, they don't grow. You don't get a second chance. And he was actually prayed for, and his intestines actually grew. And he's telling this whole story, and it's really amazing. And a lot of the, the things that he's telling, as I'm sitting there listening to this, he's using words that I know because of Christopher. Yeah, they were talking about gastrostomy. Yeah. Gastos- gast- 
I can't say. Gastrostomy, Gastrostomy tubes, tubes. Gastrostomy tubes. Gastrostomy tubes. Uh, Nissen yeah. fundoplication, all of these things that, that Christopher had had. So here we're understanding what this is, but most of the people in the room probably, have no probably idea. Didn't have any idea. And so it it really got my attention as he was talking, and um, I just really felt like God was telling me, you know, you should go up and talk to him when this is all over. And I kept making excuses. Well, you know, there's a lot of people here, and everybody's going to want to talk to him. And then I kind of in my ear again, you know, no, I want you to go talk to him. Well. You know, he's going to be busy there, you know, and I've got my friends here because we had sponsored the table and we had invited some of our friends to come and, and that would be rude. I don't want to leave them. And, and, you know, God just kept telling me, I don't worry about it. They'll understand. And basically by the time it was over, I just decided, okay, I'm just going to go up there and, and Bruce was done talking. So he came and sat down and then I started to walk up and, we started talking and I started telling him about Christopher and he says, well, has anybody ever prayed for him? And I was like, well, tons all, of times, all the time. you know, <laughs> every day. And, uh, he says, well, <laughs> what would it hurt one more time? Mm -hmm. oh, well, get, you got me there, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, sure. And he says, well, is he here? And I said, well, no, he doesn't like to go to charity dinners with his parents. <laughs> <laughs> he was 16 at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, so he said, he's not from, He's from Wisconsin. He's not from Oregon, which is where we live. And, and so he had no idea where we lived or how far away Christopher was. And he says, you know, I'm going to be speaking at this church tomorrow. Maybe your family could come bring Christopher with you. And um, he said, I'm going to be giving this same speech tomorrow. And um, then afterwards, come and find me and we can we can pray for him and, and, and see what happens. And so that's basically what we did. We went home that night. We talked about it. I talked to Christopher about it, about going and... Uh, the next morning, we ended up going to um, Destiny Church uh, here in Oregon, and we we listened to Bruce Van Atta speak again, which was really great because then our, our th all three of our kids were there, so they got to hear mm -hmm. his story and, and the miraculous things that God had done um, to to save his life and you know helping him with the severed arteries, the, the intestines growing, the whole thing, and so they got to hear all of that too. So. Just that part was was really neat that they got to do, and then um, during the service, Christopher could kind of talk about that, how how you started feeling when Bruce got up to start talking. He started noticing God moving in him even at that point. Yeah, um, um, it felt more like a pulse uh, in my stomach like the whole time. Um, um, it felt like a heartbeat kind of, but like um, uh, in my stomach section, um. Almost like a vibration. Yeah, it was more like that, like the whole time, like throughout like the whole sermon. Um, like a nervous stomach almost, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a pretty weird feeling, but um, I never felt like anything like that before. And you didn't have control over it, you uh -uh, said. Uh -uh. It just was kind of like doing <clears throat> it on its own. And, um, and um, I was just happy, and, and I was excited because I felt like um, uh, I felt like, like God was going to do like something big in my life, mm -hmm. so... You were excited, excited for about what was going to happen. Uh huh. Yeah. I was really excited. Yeah, so, so after the service, then Bruce we finished met talking. Up with Bruce and and we went up to the front, um, our family, and we found him just like he'd asked us to do. And the first thing, I mean, we had met Bruce, but of course Chris hadn't. And so we introduced Chris and Bruce to each other. And the first thing they did was lift up their shirts and start giving <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> comparing battle scars and you know my tubes here did you have this yeah. and that kind of thing and and so that was kind of neat so they kind of developed this just this instant camaraderie which was really kind of neat and then Bruce kind of explained you know that um he he could pray for Christopher and he said you know I don't know what God's timing is what his methods are or his plans are because they're they're all his own and they're all perfect and he said Sometimes I pray for people and they are healed and, and sometimes they're not, but it's all up to God. It isn't anything special that about Bruce in particular that he, he just is the go-between. He just does the praying and sometimes God works and does healing and sometimes he doesn't. And so he told Christopher all of this and you know just asked him, would you like me to pray for you? And Chris said, Sure. You know, he had nothing Definitely. to lose. You know, we were all very excited. And um, at that time, we didn't even know what had been going on during the sermon with Chris, you know, starting to have that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but we all gathered around Christopher and um, Bruce started praying and then kind of tell him what it felt like. Um, 
uh, it's not the same feeling. Um, uh, uh, it was like intensified like a, mm. um, uh, like a lot more and everything. And um, <clears throat> uh, I don't remember like uh, I don't remember uh, what he said uh, throughout the prayer. Um, I was kind of like mainly focusing on like the feeling on my stomach. Um, uh, it felt like a vibrating um, kind of like, mm-hmm. like a, in like this region. And um, um, uh, and at the very end of the prayer, um, uh, I felt like a shock go. Um, I was from my right shoulder down mm-hmm. through my stomach um, and right then and there like I knew I was healed like um, It was kind of like a sense of relief type thing um, Kind of like I was carrying like, this burden around me like, to, like um, uh, Throughout like, my whole life and everything and um, I just felt like just this huge burden like, got taken off of me and um, Yeah, yeah when so, I was was watching the prayer to or mm-hmm. you know when we were praying along at one point when we started praying right at the beginning Christopher kind of went like this and, and grabbed his stomach and, and he says it, it really hurts it really hurts mm-hmm. and Bruce said do, do we need to stop do you need to sit mm-hmm. down and Christopher said no you know I'm okay we can keep going and and Bruce said yeah we need to keep going we're, we're not done yet well I had to pray with my eyes wide open I, I just couldn't close my eyes because when I looked at Christopher at that moment the tube that the feeding tube that was underneath his t-shirt and he had just a, a regular t-shirt on a light t-shirt and you it, they would stick out a little bit you could kind of see them protruding out a little bit mm-hmm. and the top one that we used for draining was vibrating so fast back and forth underneath i could see it vibrating underneath his t- his t-shirt and so i was you know instantly just i could not not look at it so they, we started praying again and i watched that and i watched that vibration from mm-hmm. the top feeding tube and i watched it follow the pattern of his intestines until it went down into the bottom feeding tube and they were both, it was all vibrating and moving. I mean, it was just the most incredible mm-hmm. thing that I've ever, ever witnessed or been mm-hmm. a part of. It was mm-hmm. just, and there was just such a feeling of, I mean, just, you could just feel the sweet weight of the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. just with us and on us and just, it was just like everything was just hyper focused mm-hmm. on this and um then we were done praying and we all kind of went out in the parking yeah, lot and looked at looked each, each other, other like what just, what happened? just <laughs> happened you know we, it's like did it really just happen mm-hmm. and like i don't know like um it took so much energy like, out of all of us yeah mm-hmm. Yeah. And and he had a basketball game later that day <laughs> so he was going to need a lot of energy so we went home and we were we started to do what we would normally do, yeah, and that we, is we started to make the tube, the the small tube to put in his backpack, and I said, why don't you just drink it? Now normally, if he was to drink it, he would start throwing it up and mm-hmm. get very sick. So you drank two cans, right? I think it was uh, about two or three cans and for the day. Yeah, everything was normal. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, it was all everything normal. Everything was normal. I just chugged it down and everything, and I felt fine. Normally, within like ten <laughs> minutes, or fifteen minutes, yeah. you'd start trying getting to very you know, get, sick. It, get mm-hmm. it sick very and everything. Sick. Yeah, yeah. So you went to the basketball. We went to the basketball game because mm-hmm. I was coaching, and on the way home. Oh wait, he uh, and when we were at the basketball game, he didn't even have to um, use the syringe to put his water yeah. in. He was able to drink the water. Mm-hmm. And then I just we, drank it all up. Yeah, and it was we started. A lot better. <laughs> yeah, we started to walk out and head home. And Christopher says, "You know, I'm not sure, Mom, because I'm not quite sure what it feels like to be hungry. Because he never knew what hungry felt like because he always had a feeding tube. And so he says, I'm not sure, but I." Th- I think I'm hungry <laughs> and you know we kind of looked at each other it's like well what do you want to eat and because we'll take you anywhere you want to go you can have whatever you want he wanted Chinese food so his very first meal was at a Chinese restaurant locally and he ordered I think yakisaba and teriyaki chicken and all of this stuff of yeah, and all this stuff and he started eating it and of course we're all looking at each other mm-hmm. like okay when's it gonna start you know mm-hmm. is this gonna hurt you know and he just kept eating he mm-hmm. ate the whole thing and we started to head home and he was like well how long does it take and I said take how long does it take for what and he says you know for to go out of your stomach because <laughs> we had that top feeding tube so we could check to see if it was still there. And I said, well, mine's still there, Chris. You know, dad's <laughs> is still in his stomach. It takes hours, you know, to completely empty. And I said, you know, if it doesn't bother mm-hmm. you tonight, just don't put your, your drain on overnight because we used to drain, you know, all of his saliva and out overnight. And let's just see what happens. In the morning, we'll check it. Mm-hmm. And 
see if it's there or not. And so you went to sleep and the next morning um, we checked it. And yeah. Uh, and it was totally gone. Like there was nothing there at all. It was, was crazy. It was just mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. And that was kind of the beginning of, of everything. And we ended up going to, back to the doctor, to his GI specialist, and telling her about what had happened. He Well, she um, was certainly surprised. Yes, because <laughs> it wasn't supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it was This was a chronic illness that, if anything... People don't get healed from this. Yeah, they expected it to get worse, not better. And um, so, yeah, she was absolutely in complete shock. But after she got over that, <laughs> she, <laughs> she recovered. Um, she said, well, let's talk about what we're going to do about this. Let's get mm. those feeding tubes out. And so it was a good idea. We had to wait. Um, she wanted to wait three months. The surgeon actually wanted to wait closer to six. So we, yeah. we that was settled on tough five. <laughs> because um, I had it for like 16 years. So I was just like, I want to get these things out right now. Just like, <laughs> let's take them out right now. And they were like, no, we have to wait. Okay. Yeah. They wanted, so, they wanted I some time. <laughs> yeah. They wanted some time to go yeah. by to prove that, okay, everything was working. Can he so gain weight? And everything. Yeah. yeah. And we can did. he maintain weight and all of those things? And so yeah. it made sense. So... Uh, then on April 26th of 2012, he actually got to go to the doctor's office. They took the tubes out, and they were hoping that they would just heal up, up on their own. Um, but it's kind of like having a, a pierced ear. When you mm -hmm. first get it, it, if you take the earring out, it'll close up really fast. So they always have you leave the earrings in. Same thing with this, with the feeding tubes. When we first got them in, if the feeding tubes came out accidentally or anything happened, we had to be very careful because... They could close up very quickly. But after 16 years of having the tubes in, it, it wasn't like that. We didn't know. Mm -hmm. Would they close up on their own all the way or not? They weren't sure. The likelihood of them mm -hmm. closing up, ha having been in there that long, was really, really low. But we thought, well, we'll just see what happens. And so he had them out April 26th. But then on June 28th of 2012, he actually had to go in and they surgically... Um, closed them up and that was kind of the end of this you know yep, the story. that was the very end and um it was a pretty amazing that was thing. a great day walking yeah. out of the hospital oh yeah that time mm -hmm. you know was a lot different than it ever been mm -hmm. before so it was really really an exciting moment so and it's amazing what it was the best said. surgery because like um um because it was like the last one like that's my um uh, that's like my 14th surgery yep. yeah yeah 14th. it was the 14th, so the 14th one so it was just like this is it for my whole life. Like, I'm mm -hmm. done with all the surgeries. This is it. It felt like, um, um, it was like a sense of relief and everything. It's just like, it was, um, yeah, it was just a great feeling. We did have, after the surgery, uh, they'd given him antibiotics through an IV before the surgery, during the surgery, and after the surgery, because he had to stay the night. And I was all drugged up and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we, he, we got to come home, and of course he was still on mm. uh, antibiotics by mouth for mm. 10 days. And so everything was going well, and things were healing up, everything was looking great. He took that last dose of antibiotics, and within a day or so, an infection. And so we were kind of disappointed. We knew about infections. We knew about <laughs> Unfortunately. infections. Unfortunately. All too well. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so the infection started. The top one was fine, but the bottom one got an infection in it. We went back to the doctor several times. They tried giving him more antibiotics. They tried opening it up a little bit, letting that infection out, kind of letting it heal back up. Nothing was working. So we waited for probably about... Um, like five days later. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, we they we tried to work it out, and because they were wanting to go back and surgically open that back up again clean and, it out. and clean, clean it, it out, out. Mm -hmm. which we really didn't want to have to do. And and then it was amazing what God did because um, I got a text message from Kim Stevens, who is with Worldwide Heart to Heart. Um, Actually, she was coming over to our house to pick up some appliances that we were sending down to donating. Honduras to donate yeah. to Honduras. Yeah. Donating it was like to a washer the, and a dryer and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. donating yeah. to the charity. And so she wanted to know if she could come that day because she had a, a pickup truck and some guys to help us load everything. And I said, sure, you know, I was supposed to take Christopher in for surgery, but I'm thinking, eh, it could wait a few minutes. <laughs> and so she came over and we were all just kind of standing around in the kitchen and talking and the the fellows she had were loading the the stuff in the back of the truck and Christopher comes down the stairs and you know oh you know gives her a big they give a big hug and oh how's it how's it going are you still eating and yeah yeah still eating 
but Lifted we have up. an infection. Little, tiny yeah. little problem. And so she, he lifted up his shirt, and she goes, ooh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a problem. And so anyway, we just kind of looked at each other, and it's like, well, you know, we should just pray over this and see what happens. And so we, it was just Christopher and I and, and uh, Kim Stevens and Christopher's friend, Brianna, was here. And we all just kind of gathered around, and Kim actually laid hands on Christopher's stomach and tell um, him it was incredible I, I felt like the same feeling um um it was all like the vibrations and everything but then at the very end um within like two hours um uh well didn't the, uh, was like a, didn't the infection kind of like almost yeah, like squirt yeah. squirt out yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah the infection um just started squirting out and it did that the whole day mm -hmm. until it was out you know everything mm -hmm. all the stuff was out. within about like a two hours like um uh, i think it was like um uh about two hours and then the, it, it was, was like a half like the size like it was yeah. like, yeah. like just half the size up. yeah and the rest of it um uh, um uh the rest was just like a scabbed over yeah. and everything and by the next morning when totally he woke fun. up the it was, it was all scabbed gone. over and yeah. everything the incision and, that yeah. had been apart it had come apart you know as the infection got worse and worse it, it opened it back up because it was stitched initially in the surgery and it started to open up but then when she prayed for him it, it, the infection started squirting out and once it was done it, you could just see it i mean it was just it was like literally like closing uh, up like within right like, before our eyes yeah yeah, yeah it, it was, was just insane. amazing and the next morning when he got up it was completely sealed shut mm -hmm. and just kind of scabbed over and it was just like that was that, that was, was the end mm -hmm. and and um so to celebrate mm -hmm. all of the miracle mm -hmm. and everything that had happened basically mm -hmm. two miracles um christopher had always wanted to do uh, uh scuba diving mm -hmm. and he what it was one thing that he wasn't able to do uh he because of the pressure having those open holes into his abdomen it could just blow up and so you know the doctor no mm -hmm. cannot do that mm -hmm. so that was the one thing in his life that we could never find a way around that he never got to do so this august in august of 2012 we went to maui and he got to go scuba diving and it was like the best thing ever like um <laughs> it felt like you were flying in like the water like um it was definitely um it was a life-changing experience because mm -hmm. um just because like where I came from to where I am now like I can never be able to do that uh, before and now I can do anything that I um, anything that my heart desires so yeah it's um. pretty awesome God is very good <laughs>